around the world, the royal family is the ultimate symbol of Great Britain. Whereas once monarchs left the country to wage wars, now they go to build allies and represent the country. Often you do see these very important people, heads of state, the presidents, the prime ministers, starstruck by meeting the royals. It's often on royal tours that we see their true power. I think it's fairly obvious to everybody across the world what the key issues are. They still have a huge amount of influence. I don't think people in the UK really realise how big the royal family is around the world. But it's on these tours that we also gain an insight into who they really are. When you're overseas with them, you get a little bit more of an idea of what makes them tick. You are getting an insight into their private lives. They're just like the rest of us. They grieve, they love, they get angry, they get sad. We've dug deep into the royal archives to find out more about the personalities that make the royal family. It's fascinating to watch the royals at such close quarters, those moments when the mask slips. I haven't yet worked out a method of splitting my wife in half. <laughs> From the moments of controversy... He said to one student, you stay here any longer and you'll end up with slitty eyes. That was a huge for all. And has never been forgotten. <laughs> my eyeball would have been hanging out. And personal heartbreak. There were arguments behind closed doors. She was very often in tears before she went out onto a public engagement. To the characters changing the royal family forever. Princess Diana really revolutionised what people expect of a royal. I'm not a political figure. I, I, I am a humanitarian figure. That was Diana. She was courageous. She produced her celebrity. With experience of hundreds of royal tours, we hear the inside story from those who have travelled with the royals as they reveal... Colin, we need uh, to change we need, sides. We, no, we don't. ..the secrets of the royal tours. Extraordinary to look back on, isn't it? September 2019. On a royal tour of Africa, Prince Harry walks through a minefield in Angola. It's 22 years after his mother, Princess Diana, took her iconic steps in the same country, highlighting the issue of landmines. To walk in her footsteps is, is clearly quite emotional for me. But without question, if she hadn't have campaigned the way that she did 22 years ago, this, would, this could arguably still be a minefield. For the world's press who were there, it was a new chapter in the story of royal tours. I thought it was very interesting and hopefully quite cathartic for Harry as well. I mean, he's he talked a lot about how he dealt with his mum's death. But I think for him to be able to continue his mother's work is very, very important to him. There was another echo of royal tours of the past. Just like Prince William in 1983 and Prince George in 2014 on Pacific tours, we saw Archie make his first real appearance while overseas in South Africa. It was a great moment when he got to meet uh, Desmond Tutu, this, this icon. Archbishop meets Archie. The Royal Tour is a great status update on how the, the family is doing and, and how they're looking. I mean, it is the, the time we really get to see the children. So they are still big news wherever you go. Harry and Meghan's tour to South Africa is the latest in more than 100 years of successful royal touring. But the monarch who made the royal tours her own was Queen Elizabeth. She got her first taste of overseas travel in 1947, when, as a 20-year-old princess, she joined Sister Margaret and her parents, King George VI and Queen Consort Elizabeth, on a trip to South Africa. Pretty well everyone in Cape Town must have been there to welcome the royal visitors. Lining the streets, watching from windows and balconies, waving and cheering. It was to have a profound effect on a young woman who had never previously left the United Kingdom. It was clear to her that her duties as Queen would go far beyond the people of Great Britain. When Princess Elizabeth was 21, she gave a very moving speech on her birthday from Cape Town in South Africa, in which she pledged herself to her people. 
History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians, with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and real royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. It was extraordinary for a girl of 21, so she was always very dutiful, very loyal and very humble. In 1952, the reign of Elizabeth II began while she was on foreign soil in Kenya. Her tour cut short by the passing of her father. As she rushed back to London, they realised there was something missing in the new Queen's luggage. The Queen was famously caught out when she was in Kenya. She didn't have anything black to wear to change into, having learned that her father had died. When her plane arrived at London Airport, with Winston Churchill waiting to greet her, the Queen had to wait on the plane while the appropriate dress was delivered. Eventually, Elizabeth II would emerge all dressed in black. The consequence of that was that from then on, all members of the royal family, wherever they go in the world, always take an outfit in black in case a member of the royal family dies while they're away. No royal has travelled as much as the Queen. My government will continue to support all constructive efforts to achieve a peaceful, just and lasting solution to this problem. Over seven decades of globetrotting, she has set the blueprint for royal tours as we know them today. Elizabeth II has really defined what it means to go on a royal tour. But why do the royals go on such tours? What exactly is the point of members of the Windsor family making these trips? The British royal family is recognised globally. They are a global phenomenon. But at the same time, uh, they're also our secret weapon. You simply cannot put a price on the value of sending the Queen or indeed any other member of the royal family overseas to represent Great Britain. Oh, the nice Queen is always her. very generous, very gracious. She's a wonderful lady. They bring soft diplomacy. They can access areas other politicians can't. It's quite different, I think, sending a member of the royal family to, say, somewhere like the Middle East, which have their own royal families as well. They can talk on a level that perhaps even our prime minister or our foreign secretary can't read. Officially, it's up to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to decide where they need to send the royals to use this soft diplomacy. The royals don't do politics, of course, but they have been dispatched by the Foreign Office to press the flesh around the EU. But when the royals are dispatched to represent Great Britain abroad, they need to be picture perfect. And there's a huge amount of planning needed. The logistics of a royal tour are vast and myriad, and they take many, many months, sometimes up to a year to plan. The planning is all about logistics, the sleeping arrangements, transport arrangements, eating arrangements. The planning is forensic. Are there loos anywhere nearby for not just the, the media, perhaps, but also for the royals themselves? No stone is left unturned, nothing is left to chance. As much as they can humanly plan for, they absolutely do. In the royal household, planning for royal tours is a huge operation. For female royals, the world's obsession with what they wear has meant they often need a large baggage allowance. I remember getting in a plane um, in Darjeeling in India and all of Kate's dresses had rows of seats to themselves. For over 20 years, Paul Burrell toured the world with the royal family, with 10 years spent as a footman for the Queen. My role on royal tours was to make sure the Queen was comfortable, that she had everything she wanted as if she was still at home. I had to make sure that the Queen had her feather down pillow on every bed that she ever slept in, with her own linen uh, 
pillowcase with ER embroidered in the corner. I had to make sure that in every bathroom that she would use, there would be a bottle of Malvern water brought with us, especially for Her Majesty. So everything is meticulously planned. The royal luggage had a less than smooth landing, a rail loaded with the Queen's dresses nearly toppling onto the tarmac. Spending days or weeks away, often needing a new outfit for each engagement, the scale of the luggage is immense. On a royal tour, I would think the Queen must take in excess of 10 tonnes of luggage. All her day clothes go into steamer trunks, which are rather like wardrobes on wheels, and there are even large leather trunks just for hats. There's another delicate issue to consider when planning a royal tour, the food. I won't say they're fussy eaters, but they know what they like and they know what they don't like. Whoa. Oh, hang on a second. <laughs> they don't eat shellfish when they're out and about because it's better being safer than sorry. <laughs> Food has always been a diplomatic minefield for the Queen on tour because she doesn't particularly like highly spiced food. For the Queen, it certainly isn't a case of when in Rome. In 2000, when she visited Italy, the Prime Minister's chef was under strict instructions. Don't make the, the garlic, a lot of garlic, a lot of onion, a lot of pepper flakes, and it's possible not the long pasta, but a little pasta, because it's important for the Queen to eat in simple style. Wherever she's been in the world, the Queen has always carried a secret treat to help get her through any engagement. The Queen likes a barley sugar in her handbag. Just something to give her that glucose and sugar when she needs it most. Throughout her long reign, the Queen's travels across the world would be vital for the monarchy, whilst her family's tours would reveal some of the most eventful moments in royal history. Queen Elizabeth II is by far the most travelled monarch in British history. Over seven decades, she has been to 117 countries and come to symbolise the best of Britain overseas. She's the only person in our country that does not need her passport. Prince Philip has one, and the Prince and Princess of Wales had passports. You are Her Majesty's Britannic subject. She can't be her own Britannic subject. In 2015, the Queen made her final overseas trip to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Malta. It was an emotional visit to a place with particular significance for her. If there is a special place in her heart, it's got to be Malta. I remember happy days here with Prince Philip when we were first married. This is the princess's first visit to the historic George Cross Island, and she was given the warmest possible reception by the people of Malta. She spent quality time with Prince Philip when he was stationed there in the Royal Navy at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. The Queen spent some of the happiest days of her marriage in Malta, almost living as an ordinary couple. Of course, that all changed when she became queen in 1952. The high and mighty princess, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, is now Queen Elizabeth II. God save the queen. <laughs> Almost immediately, her life of royal tours began with her most epic. In November 1953, she went on a six-month tour of the new Commonwealth formed in the wake of a crumbling empire. Her father had ingrained that sense of duty from a very early stage in Elizabeth's life. And so for her, there was no question when her advisers suggested this tour of the Commonwealth that it was absolutely what she must do. The tour was seen as vital in ensuring the unity of the Commonwealth, something that has been an enduring passion for her. But it meant leaving two young children, Anne and, of course, Charles, behind. But the Queen understood from an early age the importance of connecting with the people. 
The tour covered over 40,000 miles as she visited 13 countries in the West Indies, Asia, Africa and Australasia. The reverence for the Queen was clear wherever she went. Yes, they certainly knew their drill, these young Australians, and what a huge welcome they offered. Prince Philip said you wouldn't believe the adulation. There were people, you know, 20 deep lining the streets in this huge, huge country. The Queen actually got so exhausted from smiling that her face ached. And Prince Philip found that he was actually waving in his sleep. It was very intense. In a rare TV appearance in 1985, the Queen reflected on this extraordinary tour. We started in Bermuda and Jamaica, having flown out there, and then through the Panama Canal and across the Pacific. So it was, it was leisurely, which is why it took so long. And then from Australia to Ceylon, then to Aden, and then an aeroplane to, to Africa, to Tobruk. Extraordinary to look back on, isn't it? Since then, Queen Elizabeth has travelled another one million miles, the equivalent of 42 journeys around the globe. The country she has visited the most is Canada, with 27 trips. But her appeal has gone far beyond that of the Commonwealth. The Queen's tours are, are, are almost sort of reverential. She's such an iconic figure now, not just in the UK, but around the world. And as she's grown older, that iconism, if you like, has, has grown. One man who's followed her around the world is renowned royal photographer Arthur Edwards. When I've been on Queen's visits, whether it's Canada or it's Ghana, the respect for her. I remember in Ghana, the, the noise, the tribes came in, it was just phenomenal. Travelling with royalty, Arthur's seen some of the memorable, unreported moments on tours. The first trip I did on the Royal Flight was the Queen from Nairobi to Dhaka in Bangladesh. We had to board an hour before the Queen. And as we boarded the plane, there were the hostesses with the trays of champagne. And of course, by the time the Queen got on an hour later, there was a party going up the back of the plane. But we never travelled with them again for 20 years, let's say no more. <laughs> I'll always remember the Duke of Edinburgh looking around the curtain, what was all the noise? <laughs> but he's also been there at some of the Queen's more awkward public encounters. One of the most infamous was in 1991, when she arrived at the White House to meet President George Bush. George made a welcoming speech, and then the Queen went up. Well, of course, the lectern was set for George and not for the Queen, and all you could see was the top of the Queen's hat. She stood behind the podium, and uh, what you had was a talking hat. Mr. President, thank you for your warm welcome to Washington. It was a very funny moment, and she took it all in her stride. Fortunately, the Queen showed her sense of humour a few days later when she addressed Congress. It was a great feeling when she stood up and, and that all the senators and the congressmen applauded her. And then she stood up and she said... I do hope you can see me today from where you are. <laughs> and they all stood up again and clapped for another two minutes. It was such a, a, a great joke. Throughout it all, wherever the Queen has gone, so has Prince Philip. He's in fact never missed one of the Queen's overseas tours. Prince Philip is, is just the perfect uh, consort because he, he, mainly he's the icebreaker. And a lot of people don't know is the Queen is, is, is quite a shy person and Philip is very good at making sure she's relaxed, in a good mood, he can lead the conversation. Down the years, however, some of these conversations have led to notorious gaffes. A British student from Edinburgh University said the Duke of Edinburgh had told him he'd found Peking ghastly and boring and suggested he go home soon in case he got slitty eyes. I was there, um, and he, he said to one student, you stay here any longer and you'll end up with slitty eyes. Now, the British press, reporting press, went apoplectic Chinese thought it was very funny, actually. Of course, it's not just the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh who have been representing the royals overseas. 
By the 1970s, a young Prince Charles was doing his fair share of flying the flag. We're particularly grateful to you to let us stay in the White House. And little did we expect that the first and the only house we would stay in on our first visit would be the White House. But with the world very different from when his mother began touring, his approach has often been less buttoned up. Prince Charles, serious man, but he was prepared to have a laugh, if you like. In particular, the prince has never turned down an opportunity to dance. Oh, yeah, he's a brilliant dancer. And then he puts his heart and soul into it. He just joins in, he can't stop himself. He'll always throw himself into the dancing. If there's food to be eaten, he'll always try it. If there's a drink to be supped, he'll always give it a try. He always absolutely throws himself into everything. If there's a good-looking lady to be, kind of have his arm around, very happy to pose. He's got natural rhythm and he gives it everything. He's just incredible. Down the years, he's also sported some interesting headwear. <laughs> Caribbean, I've seen him put a, a Rasta wig on. I'm not sure he'd get away with that sort of cultural appropriation these days. In the rainforest, he wore a fantastic feathered headdress that someone presented to him in Central America. And he was sort of up for it, if you like. And he knew it would make a good picture. And if it helped tell the story of why he was there, then he was happy to do so. For the royals, though, the press story hasn't always been up to them. When Prince Charles visited Australia in 1979, he was the most eligible bachelor on the planet. So when a young model gave him a kiss as he emerged from the sea, it caused a sensation. It was a great image for Charles, and it was a very manly picture of him. And um, you know, I think it, it did his PR and his image, a um, huge amount of good. In just over a year, his engagement to Lady Diana Spencer was announced. For the royals, everything was about to change. She wanted to be an ambassador roving around the world, showing, not telling, showing people what was happening. Princess Diana would revolutionize the image of the royal tour forever. Royal tours give us a special insight into the lives and personalities of the British royal family. The Queen set the standard, traveling more than any other monarch in history. Charles was tasked with bringing the royal image up to date, but Princess Diana's arrival would change everything. It really started, that whole Diana mania, die mania, it was called by the press, in Australia on that first tour that she and Charles went on. It was incredible, the reception. I'll never, I'll never forget it. I remember at Sydney Opera House, they couldn't get any more people there. Brisbane, they closed Brisbane, you know, they couldn't get any more people into Brisbane. And, you know, the crowds were sort of five, six, seven, eight deep. Diana's enormous appeal was grounded in a fresh, personable approach. She's the first person I remember seeing kneeling down to a child in the crowd. People just went, went weak at the knees when they saw her. I haven't yet worked out a method of splitting my wife in half. <laughs> <laughs> she can do both sides. The focus was very much on Diana, but at that time, Charles didn't seem to be minding. He might have done, but it was very much on her. And he was like an also ran. But I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives. <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. <laughs> and I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. Millions of Australians turned out to meet the couple, and for the first time ever, a royal baby, a nine month old Prince William. All we can say is that it has been the greatest possible joy and pleasure to have him with us during this visit. I think Prince William was the first royal child to certainly go as far as Australia. He had what we called a crawlabout in the grounds of Government House in Auckland in this sort of beautiful silk romper suit. And, you know, they got the pictures. 
Diana's first royal tour was a huge success, but she had done things her way, not necessarily the royal way. The princess broke protocol every single day on a royal tour. She did kneel down to speak to children. She did wear no gloves. She was told to wear gloves. Diana, you must wear gloves. If you touch these people, you might catch something. Of course, Diana wanted to do it her way. She didn't wear gloves. She did kneel down to children. She found her level. She was the first royal celebrity, if you like, and it wasn't just confined to the UK. Diana's royal celebrity appealed not just to the public, but also to the press. In 1985, Charles and Diana travelled to Washington with the world's media watching. American trips were always huge for the royals because the crowds in America were big and they were always very starry. And no crowd was starrier than the celebrities that gathered for a formal reception at Ronald Reagan's White House. We flew into Washington and I was told when I got off the plane, you've got the pool tonight, so we got all the arrivals. Creme de la America, you know, anyone who had money was there. They were totally starstruck by Diana because I suppose she was a, 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 probably as big a star as they were. Diana knew that on the guest list was the ballet star Mikhail Baryshnikov. And she was longing to dance with Baryshnikov at the White House because she knew there would be dancing. Nancy Reagan, Reagan's wife, had, had a very different idea and wanted her to dance with some of the, the major uh, Hollywood celebrities that she'd invited, including Clint Eastwood, who was going to be there. But in the end, it was John Travolta who was chosen to dance with her. Of all the great pictures, of course, the greatest picture of all was her dancing with, with the legend. When the tours go well, uh, then the planning is brilliant and everything is, 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 is ticked, all the boxes are necessarily ticked off, uh, and they feel incredibly efficient. But sometimes they don't go well, and um, for any kind of, uh, of reasons. And um, then they can seem chaotic, disorganized, and, and frankly, a complete mess. By the time of their 1986 tour to Canada, the press attention had become overwhelming for Diana. I don't think it was a happy period um, for Diana because she was very quiet. The heavy, almost relentless schedule of events was beginning to wear her down, particularly the constant touring of Expo Pavilions, five hours of it at a time. She famously fainted after visiting the Expo exhibition in Vancouver, Vancouver Island. She was led away, much distressed by her doctor, Surgeon Commander Ian Jenkins. The prince followed behind. She recovered in the pavilion's washroom. The response was frenzied, both from the authorities and the press. We stopped off somewhere, I can't remember where, and the phones were going mad, all the journalists. I particularly remember Harry Arnold ringing his news desk. And I remember Harry came up and he was white. He said, they want me to turn the plane around. That's how big it was. I mean, that, she was a mega story. And uh, I, remember, I remember the editor screaming at Ken Gavin and my mate, like, get back to Rally, get back to Vancouver. The press instantly got hold of the wrong end of the stick, that she must be pregnant. She wasn't pregnant. She simply didn't have the strength and the heat of the day. It all became too much for her. Charles's attempt to lighten the mood fell rather flat. It's really entirely due to the extremely advantageous conditions uh, that pertain in British Columbia, the weather, and the general uh, fertile conditions, which uh, have ensured that she's about to have sex duplets, which is really why she fainted. <laughs> it's not actually true, but there we are. For Charles, the media circus around Diana was part of a larger problem. Wherever they went, it was Diana that people wanted to see. Why are they shouting your name? We, you're just my wife. I'm the royal. I'm the man that was born to be king. You were not. 
So it caused very difficult problems for the royal couple. And that did translate to unhappy royal tours. Tragically, for, for Charles and Diana, um, the issue of their marriage and their clear unhappiness became the central theme of the reporting about, about them from, really, from the late 1980s onwards. Um, there were, we were picking up all sorts of signs, particularly when we were on tour with them, that, that all was not well. Matters really came to a head, I guess, in early 1992, when they were scheduled to visit India. By that time, 1992, the marriage was really on the rocks. You could see the tensions of the marriage were overtaking the whole uh, agenda, and um, you know they weren't helping each other. Famously, as, as a bachelor, Charles had visited the Taj Mahal and had said at the time that one day he would like to come back here with his wife. So we knew all about that, and here we are many years later wondering if that was going to happen. And the Taj Mahal is indeed slated for a visit, but it's just Princess Diana. A wiser prince than I would have opted for a visit to the Taj Mahal and the Red Fort at Agra, which I believe is where some, at least, of the greatest pundits of the press think I ought to be anyway. The palace were really unable to control things. Both Charles and Diana were were running their own briefing operations. They had their friends in the media. Stories were being dripped out about the state of the marriage. Uh, it was very difficult. We see that iconic photograph of Diana sitting on the, on the, on the, on the seat in the Taj behind the background. Well, actually, and moments before, there was just hundreds of people all around her. And it was only that when the photographers and the reporters managed to persuade her to do it and then fired in the question, how does it make you feel? And she said, uh, it's a very healing experience. And, and someone said, what do you mean by that? And she said, I'll make of it what you will. And of course, the press made quite a lot of it. This was quite a difficult tour for her in trying to perform and look as though everything was OK when actually she knew it wasn't. But more importantly, of course, the the, the following paparazzi and press knew also. It was really the beginning of the end of Royal Tours for both the prince and the princess. By the time they went to Korea, just month, weeks before the John Major announced the separation in the House of Commons, th th they, were, they, were, they were clearly at breaking point. And the plane landed, the door opened, and Mr and Mrs Glum stood in the doorway. And it was not if, but when they would announce when they would separate. Neither of them particularly wanted to go on it. The prince and princess were barely talking at this point. There's a wonderful photograph of them looking out of the car opposite sides. I mean, they would rather have been anywhere on Earth than in the same car together. It was widely perceived as being a, a disastrous tour. To this day, I can't really tell you why we were there. We asked uh, Dickie Arbiter, who was the press secretary at the time, when the next royal tour was going to be of the couple, and he said he wouldn't give us the, the, the time. Understand, he wouldn't tell us who it was. And we said, well, if you don't tell us, we're going to write that this is the last one and the marriage is over. Well, pretty much we've got it right. Charles and Diana separated in 1992. Despite that, she retained her privileges as a member of the royal family, including official travel abroad. Her tours post-separation were sort of very stripped down royal tours and there was an, a, an informality about them. She was going to parts of the world like remoter parts of Indonesia where there were still these leper colonies. The idea of them still existing seemed extraordinary in, in, in the late 20th century. And I remember Diana going to this institution and shaking people's hands. I mean, this was at a time when people still felt that if you shook the hand of a leper, you might lose your finger. Diana was heavily criticised in the media at that time, and yet despite that criticism, she stuck with it. I mean, even the Queen herself was unhappy with Diana being involved. I may say unhappy. She, she had told Diana, why don't you do something nice? It wasn't a question of doing something nice. It was a question of saying, what can I do as a member of the royal family to make things work and change? Diana certainly did have the wow factor. One particular instance, I think, of Diana in Angola, walking through a cleared minefield. 
Colin, we need uh, to change sides. We need, sides. We need the, the no, side. Yeah, yeah, I when Diana chose to walk through a live minefield, the press were there to capture the moment. The guy is in with her. We need her up nearest to side. Yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we need the fool out of the way as well. The minefield had been cleared, and it was a minefield, but I mean, it had, the path had been cleared. There were mines either side, but it had been checked. But the funny thing about that was, of course, the photographers, was, <laughs> we were all, you know, cheated up to get the pictures. She, there she is in the visor, and she's just walked through the minefield, and they weren't happy, so they asked her to walk through again, and she did it a second time, because they didn't get the best pictures. This, this is very much early phase. We put in pioneering lanes to see what's going on. Where do you know it works? Angola was in the depths of a brutal civil war, one that had killed more than 400,000 civilians. That iconic picture was a red light moment. People sort of took notice that, yes, yeah, something has got to be done. This nation has the highest number of amputees per population than anywhere in the world. The current statistic stands at one amputee per 334 inhabitants. I think that she did an amazing job to raise the profile of the problem. Until then, nobody really knew about the issue in Angola or in Bosnia. And, um, you know, her sitting there with these terribly maimed children, these are hugely emotive photographs. And really, when you were up close seeing it, you know, you, you have a lump in your throat when you, you, you see the injuries that these terrible things have caused. Landmines were banned almost worldwide shortly after Diana's visit, but the praise was not universal. She was getting absolutely lambasted by the government, saying that she shouldn't get involved in political issues. She insisted she had not been worried by the debate back home that had resulted from her comments. I saw it merely as a distraction because I'm not a political figure. I, and I am a humanitarian figure and always have been and always will be. She was courageous. She would push the boundaries to try to, to use her celebrity for the better. Diana's tour of Angola was her last royal engagement. It would be left to her sons to shape the royal tours of the future. Princess Diana really revolutionised what people expect of a royal. For two things off the top of my head, her work with landmines charities and her work with uh, AIDS charities, that had not been seen before. Harry has been particularly informed by his mother's legacy. His and Meghan's tour to South Africa has focused on environmental conservation, AIDS awareness, and the empowerment of women. I think um, William and Harry and, uh, and their wives want to, to forge their own paths, but they are influenced, obviously, by what's gone before, and I think they're particularly influenced by their mother, particularly Harry, who has followed in his mother's footsteps in the sense that he's taken up many of the issues that she was involved in. Harry went back to Huambo and to show what a positive effect the Halo Trust has had in, in clearing landmines. Now, that minefield where Dinah was famously pictured with lots and lots of kind of vegetation, now it's a shopping street. To walk in her footsteps is, is clearly quite emotional for me. Um, but I think as much as, she, as much as she did then, there is still so much to do. But without question, if she hadn't have campaigned the way that she did, 22 years ago, this would, this could arguably still be a minefield. It was hopefully quite cathartic for Harry as well. I mean, he, he's talked a lot about how he dealt with his mum's death, but I think for him to be able to continue his mother's work is very, very important to him. Firing! The new generation of royals have been left with a choice the Queen's reserved formality or Diana's political and proactive role. It's not a question of any one individual modernising the monarchy. It's just that it's the way that they do their individual engagements, the way they approach things. Harry is much more um, relaxed. He has a, an informal streak. He doesn't like the clunking officialdom that uh, often associates royalty. He likes going about things in his own rather unique way. He likes being called Harry. You know, he's not so worried about formal titles like your Royal Highness. When I've traveled with Harry, it's incredible. Well, Harry is like special for young people. He's, 
he, he just will not quit until he's made that child happy, some way happy. In Lesotho, which he started this amazing charity called Santa Bale with the, the Prince of Lesotho, you know, he's been there many times working to help the children there. Although our situations couldn't have been more different, I felt an overwhelming connection to many of the children I met. We shared a similar feeling of loss, having a loved one, in my case a parent, snatched away so suddenly. What he did there, which was the most amazing thing, he started a night school for them because they, none of them, they get no education. When you see someone like that, when you see something like that, you see him, you obviously see Diana, because that's what she would do. The kids walk for up to two hours of a night to come there, and the teacher was teaching them simple maths, and they were riveted. Afterwards, I said, uh, it's important to you, Harry, this. He said, this is the most important thing I've ever done. William, a future king, has chosen a more formal approach. William is going to be the king, a future monarch, so he's slightly more cautious about what he does and how much he reveals of himself. In that regard, he's much more like his grandmother. On their 2014 tour to Australia, William and his family played their role to perfection. You have to remember that there was a growing feeling of republicanism in Australia at that time. You know, certainly the idea of, of the country perhaps going down a republic route was becoming more of a, more of a possibility. It was a, it was a narrative that had been gathering momentum. Well, Prince George turned all of that round the minute that we saw him coming down the steps of the plane. Prince George was hailed in the press, I think, around the world, the Republican Slayer. I spoke to somebody from the Republican group in uh, Sydney who, he wouldn't say this on camera, but uh, off camera, he said, we're stuffed. <laughs> that tour ended up being arguably the most successful tour to Australia and New Zealand for the royal family. It went so amazingly well. It brought them a huge amount of goodwill from the Australian and New Zealand people to them as a family and by extension to the royal family. And that is what this is all about, currying favour, forging those connections for the decades to come. On royal tours, particularly with Harry and William, if they're visiting a country that their parents have been to, quite a lot of thought is put into if they're visiting a site where their parents have visited, are they going to do something similar? Are they going to, going to do something different? In Agra, when William and Kate went to the Taj Mahal, there was a huge hoo-ha about whether William and Kate were going to recreate that iconic picture of Princess Diana in 1992 sitting on her own. I was there for that Taj Mahal moment, and we weren't sure until it actually happened that they were going to do it. I mean, they, they're aware that it's an iconic photograph. They're aware that the Indian government wants an iconic photograph of them in front of the Taj Mahal. You know, they know that's what's required from their role. And however much it is history repeating itself, there are some things they just have to do. Eventually, on the morning of their visit to the Taj, we were told, yes, William and Kate would sit on that bench. Yes, they were posed in exactly the same spot as William's mother. That must have been quite, maybe not a tricky decision for him, because obviously the right decision was to sit there, pose with Kate, aren't we happy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it must have thrown up a lot of emotion. I'm not sure if William really wanted to do it, but I think he realised that the public wanted to see it, the press certainly wanted to see it. It's no secret that the relationship between the media and the royal family is, is fractious at times, tenuous, it's not always a bed of roses, I think it's fair to say. Um, on royal tours, you get, I think, more cooperation and collaboration probably than at any other time. And I think that's quite simply because they want the tour to be a success. They need that oxygen of publicity. They need the media to be behind it. October 2019. William and Kate arrive in Pakistan for another royal tour. It's the first trip by a royal to the country in 12 years. And seen as vital for continuing good relations between nations with strong historical links. 
think it is the most important ambassadorial role for any member of the royal family to be sent overseas to represent the Queen and country. Certainly when you talk to people from the Foreign Office, they say that sending royals abroad is one of the most important things that, that, that we can do. Hello. Prince William is part of the new generation representing Great Britain on royal tours and following in the footsteps of his family. His mother, Diana, visited Pakistan three times in the 90s. She was friends with Imran Khan, who 22 years later, William met as the country's prime minister. I want, if I told you that I would uh, one day succeed, I didn't realize it would take me 22 years. <laughs> William's grandmother, the Queen, visited Pakistan twice, the first time in 1961. Karachi pelted the royal car with rose petals at the start of the visit to Pakistan. But for this latest tour in Pakistan, it's hard to recreate such scenes. This is one of the most complex royal tours of recent times with security a big concern. I've spoken to aides who have done reccees, and often at least two reccees will go into a, an overseas trip. Massive security issues around that, but diplomatically very important for the rest of the world to see that you know, a future king is going to Pakistan and you know it's a great country, it's worth investing in and it's worth going to. A key detail for the royals, wherever they go, are the cultural sensitivities they need to respect in each country. Certain countries, you've got to abide by uh, their customs, um, head covering if you go to a Muslim country. You do have to be careful, particularly for the women, in the way that you dress. When Kate was in Kuala Lumpur, she visited a mosque, and obviously you have to be quite you know, aware of the places that you're visiting, dress appropriately. Are you going to have to take your shoes off? Kate and William had to take their shoes off when we visited Gandhi's house in Delhi. So we're all kind of obsessed with looking at Kate's feet. William and Kate were following a path previously trodden by the Queen, who over her decades of travelling the world hasn't been exempt from following local customs. For the Queen, the High Commission had thoughtfully provided British Airways slipperettes. She's very, very careful to be exactly what is expected of her. You have to bow to the customs of the country because that is polite. And there's no point going somewhere and not being polite. Good morning, French But while the royals are always at pains to follow the correct procedure everywhere they go, the usual protocols around how you treat the royal family can go awry when they're overseas. These pupils were too young to understand royal protocol and fascinated by their important visitor. Little girls competed for his attention. Sometimes, though, it can lead to charming moments. One child grasped his hand and refused to leave his side. They didn't want to see him go. For over 20 years, Paul Burrell toured the world with the royals. He witnessed the lengths they'd go to limit any embarrassment if the right etiquette wasn't followed. In the South Pacific, we had a Tongan prince who came on board for the state banquet. And right at the end of the meal, everyone is presented with a dessert plate and a bowl of water to wash your fingers. The Tongan prince was putting each piece of fruit inside his water dish, poured the cream and sugar inside the dish too. And as he lifted this soup fruit to his lips, he caught the Queen's eye and realised he was the only person on the table doing it. Embarrassed by his faux pas, he put his dish down and the Queen looked and smiled, picked up her dish and took a sip from her water. Now that is class. There is one thing the Queen can't stand, though, and it led to her trip to Morocco in 1980 being dubbed the Tour of Hell. The king was notoriously tardy about punctuality, and he didn't turn up, and he was hours late for the queen, and the queen had to wait. I mean, she kept up uh, a fantastic expression, but we learned later that she was absolutely furious, absolutely furious that she'd been kept waiting all this time. I mean, it's not because she feels that it's disrespectful to her, 
But, you know, she's got a full day of engagements. It meant that everything ran late, and it meant that the Queen was going to keep other people late, and that was her concern. Whatever the stresses and strains of royal tours, for years the royals had the comfort of travelling in their own little part of Britain, the Royal Yacht Britannia. That was the Queen's favourite mode of transport, and while she might have been hundreds of thousands of miles away from Balmoral or Sandringham or Windsor, actually Britannia had become a second home, a home on the seas, and she used to love travelling on the yacht. It's always an exciting moment to board a ship, of course. How much more so when it's the first time and when it's the Royal Yacht Britannia and a real voyage of exploration and discovery lies ahead. Her maiden voyage in 1954 saw her carry Princess Anne and Prince Charles to Tobruk to meet the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh at the end of their six-month Commonwealth tour. One month later, returning to London, Britannia and its royal passengers had a spectacular welcome. They sailed up the Thames and it was a huge fanfare and Tower Bridge opened and people were screaming and cheering and welcoming them home. All are gathered to greet the young queen and her husband and to say with the nation, welcome back. For 43 years, she sailed round the globe, traveling more than a million nautical miles, calling at over 600 ports in 135 countries. I particularly loved traveling on board the Royal Britannia. Former footman to the Queen, Paul Burrell, experienced what it was like on board. Royal Rock Britannia was a kind of country house floating in a foreign sea. And Britannia, for the Queen, was home away from home. If you ever visit Britannia, you will see how humble it is in many respects. Of course, the Queen slept in a single bed. Prince Philip had his own quarters. But the Queen loved Britannia because of the camaraderie on board. She loved the fact that everybody was working for her and working for that excellence in foreign countries. Whenever the Queen arrived, everything was perfect. We all made sure that we did our best. With all the gifts the Queen received on tour, Britannia could end up looking like a treasure ship. I was in the Gulf States with the Queen. We visited Kuwait, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and Oman. It's very interesting to watch sultans from other countries and how they communicate with the Queen. They're almost in reverence of the Queen. And I remember floating around the Gulf on board Britannia, and each state tried to outdo the next with gifts. The Queen was given sapphires, emeralds and pearls, a golden falcon studded with rubies, beautiful golden palm trees with rubies hanging from them as, as dates, with camels on lapis lazuli. You, you should have seen the treasure that came back from the Gulf. It was quite amazing. Britannia was the scene of many important gatherings down the years. President of Gambia and Lady Chawara. A place the Queen could host even when she was on tour. And it was somewhere the royals could use their brand of diplomacy. Britannia was a, a statement of Great Britain, because it wasn't just used by the royal family. It was used by the government and ministers, and it was used to host parties. And every time they got to a new country, Britannia would be there on the dockside as a symbol of Great Britain. While Britannia played its role in historic world events, like the handover of Hong Kong to China in 1997, it's perhaps best remembered for the more intimate family moments. Prince William tried a small wave. In 1985 in Venice, Prince Harry made one of his first public appearances. Prince Harry was cheerfully unaware of the fuss. Although Prince William stole the limelight. And then Prince William produced the two-handed version of the wave, which happens to be the very Italian way of saying ciao. After 44 years sailing the royals across the world, in 1997, Britannia was decommissioned. 
piped aboard for the final time, the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh came to say goodbye to a yacht whose royal duties spanned nearly half a century. When she was decommissioned, I think the royal family were very, very sad. A lot of people were very sad. And um, the Queen actually said, I, um, it was the only time really in my year that I can totally relax is when I'm on board Britannic. Yeah. And it was incredibly emotional for them. And the Queen appeared to wipe a tear from her eye. For decades, the Queen and her family have traveled the world, representing the country and giving us some insight into their lives. But in that time, their tours have sometimes been controversial and they face danger as high profile targets. There aren't many countries in the world the royal family haven't visited. The Queen alone has made over 270 foreign trips, traveling over one million miles. Wherever the royals travel, they usually have some interesting experiences. Prince Charles was treated to what his host described as a bit of local culture. As the entertainers gyrated in front of him, he seemed amused, if slightly embarrassed. But while they can seem like a never-ending procession of walkabouts and polite exchanges, royal tours have often been groundbreaking. There's no free press in communist Cuba and no royal has ever been here on a formal visit before today. In March 2019, Prince Charles travelled with the Duchess of Cornwall to a former Cold War enemy, Cuba, as Britain looks to improve relations. You can't rewrite history, but you can move forward with the present. And all these visits are incredibly important, not just for the country that's being visited, but for the United Kingdom in, in its relationship with the rest of the world. The Queen has led the way with landmark tours that once would have been unthinkable. In 1986, she became the first British monarch to visit China. The Queen lightened the climb. She walked three times as far as the planners had allowed for and wasn't at the least bit puffed at the end. Going to China was a landmark tour. It had never been a visit by a British monarch to, to China. It was diplomatically right, and the UK wanted to increase its trade with that particular country. By now, the Queen was almost at the end of her chosen distance. She looked over the ramparts. I will never forget walking behind the Queen on the Great Wall of China because she was wearing purple. And I remember purple is such a regal color. And that was the right color for her to wear at such an iconic site. At the end, she was thoughtful, as most of us are, confronted by the grandeur, the scale, the beautiful defiance of the Great Wall of China. She was quite moved by that, uh, to, to, to stand on it. I mean, I felt immense power standing on, on the Great Wall. I never believed in my lifetime that I would ever get to it. So I was very fortunate to get to it. In 1994, the Queen similarly made history when after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, she visited Russia, even staying at the Kremlin. The royal couple advanced towards their host inside what was once the headquarters of the Soviet Cold War enemy. Going to Russia was important. Russia had, had uh, dropped its mantle of Soviet Union. It was important that she went. She was fated by Boris Yeltsin. Probably Boris a bit over the top. It was a moment for the Queen to save her, a moment when history was made. Such royal tours can be seen as a way of Britain offering the hand of friendship after years of tension. In 1999, Prince Charles traveled to Argentina, the first visit by a royal since the Falklands War. I pray that this visit of mine will help in at least a modest way, to show the people of Argentina the commitment which the British people have made to this process. Despite these words, there were still those in Argentina who were against such a royal visit. Closer to home, the Queen made one of her most important royal tours in 2011. 
The most special tour for me was the Queen's visit to the Republic of Ireland in 2011. Because it meant so much to her, and it meant so much to the people of Ireland that, you know, for years and years she couldn't actually go. And finally she got to go. As the first British monarch to visit Ireland in a century, it was seen as a historic tour of reconciliation. It was very important symbolically. Obviously, they're our nearest neighbours. Obviously, we're linked in so many ways, and there have been problems over the years. But I think that was, that was a real privilege to do that one. Of course, such a visit will still face some hostility. But wherever the royals go, they've always been high-profile targets for protesters. It makes security the number one concern on any royal tour. The Queen says, I have to be seen to be believed, and that has been part of royal processions over the centuries. She invented the walkabout, which, you know, gives the security details sleepless nights, but she will, and her son and her children and her grandchildren, will go and meet people in the crowd. Superintendent John McLean, the Prince's personal detective, has the most nerve-wracking role, particularly during walkabouts, when his boss is most exposed to danger. His whole body is in constant movement, bringing about the dance of the anxious policeman. The walkabout is the twitchiest moment for the bodyguards because you don't know if there's somebody in that crowd who has bad intentions. Ken Wolf was a royal protection officer for over 15 years. For six of them, he was Princess Diana's personal bodyguard and he went on many royal tours overseas. The success of any tour is, is, the, is the real groundwork of the reconnaissance, you know, building up relationships with your counterpart, um, understanding, you know, what the likely threats are going to be, um, and letting them know that, that in Diana's case, she's quite tactile, so she, you know, she will want to shake hands with people, and you say, is that going to be OK? Are we going to, are, are we going to be able to screen individuals and we are, are we able to remove people that are likely to become either offended because of her easy guy or, or are there any known activists here that are going to take opportunity of her behavior each tour has always had a range of security precautions in place including divers checking the royal yacht britannia there's always a an evacuation procedure attached to any location in case something like that goes wrong so you build up a series of safe houses, whereby that if something were to go horrendous, then of course we need to know where, you know, the hospitals were, where this safe house was, could we go back and so forth. So all those things are, are, are well researched and, and, and well practiced. And in the early days, of course, we used to take a doctor with us. One had to be careful about if there were to be a blood transfusion, are we going to make sure we get the right blood? So we used to take a doctor and our own refrigerator full of blood and everybody on tour, his or her blood group will be known to that traveling doctor. For the Queen, there have been a number of times she's traveled to parts of the world with security concerns. Perhaps none more than when she went to Jordan in 1984 and met King Hussein, a man who'd survived 12 assassination attempts. There was a lot of um, controversy and, and questions as to whether the Queen should be going to Jordan, given the number of uh, assassination attempts on King Hussein. Ahead of her lay five days of tightly controlled movements, of high-speed journeys in bulletproof cars, of seeing men with guns virtually every waking moment. But the Queen is, is quite pragmatic about these things, that if something can be done, it's going to be done. Then you go ahead with the visit. Fortunately, the tour was a success and passed without incident. Two years later, however, during a trip to New Zealand, there was an attack. Three eggs were thrown by two girls wearing stewards' white coats. They were quickly seized, but security had failed. Luckily, only eggs were thrown by activists protesting about Maori rights. It's one of those events that is, is what we call a soft-hearted attack. It's embarrassing because what happens, of course, is that when the press get hold of it, they're very critical of the protecting, uh, the protectors. And so it's always a learning curve. But to be honest, there's not a great deal you can do about it. And you just hope that it isn't a stone and you deal with it. You know, despite the level of security and despite the, 
the, the rigor of a good reconnaissance, you know, things can still go wrong. And, you know, if it does, you just have to rely on your own protection team and your gut instincts. However much they plan, it seems royal tours can have their unpredictable moments. Down the years, many of these have been caught on film. It's when things go wrong that royal tours can really come alive. Royal tours are carefully scripted performances designed to show off the House of Windsor to the greatest advantage. There is something about the glamour of the House of Windsor which um, exceeds any other royal house in, in the world. There's more written about them than any of the other European royals. I mean, now that we have um, social media, we know an awful lot more about the European royalty, but they seem pretty dull compared to our family. And people love to read about the dramas and the weddings and the babies and the scandals and the things they will do and the things they won't do. It, 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 they just love to read about it. So when there's an opportunity to see them, people are really interested. With the unrelenting attention of the press, the pressure to put on a perfect show is enormous. But over the more than 400 royal tours in the last 70 years, it's the human moments that seem to have the most appeal. Sometimes things don't run to plan. And actually, when things go wrong or when they don't run to plan, that can actually be the best bit of any royal tour, both for the press, because obviously we love a good story. <laughs> but the royals love it too, because for them, this very strict timetable can be quite, although it's quite comforting and you know where you've got to be and everything's timed and you're in the, in the car at this time and out the car at that time and on the plane, etc. When things go wrong, they love it. You can sometimes see if something goes wrong or someone's not quite where they should be, they kind of, they look at each other and they're trying not to laugh or just catch each other's eye and there's a little smile and they're like, okay, we're just gonna go with this. I remember in Canada in, 2016, we were at a food fair up in the north of Canada. It was a, a lovely occasion. We were outside, the weather was great. It was a sort of food and wine festival. And suddenly, um, we saw this mollusk. It's a Canadian speciality called Duduck. It's called, a, they, the nickname is a phallic clam. It's this clam that kind of the mollusk kind of comes out of, and it does look quite phallic. So obviously, we were all hoping that William and Kate would go over to this particular stall and would go and have a look at this phallic clam, because we thought it'd be quite funny. And to give William and Kate their due, um, they were very game. They played along. But to everyone's surprise, suddenly, the guy behind the stool suddenly offered up <laughs> this jewel duck that had been cooked, sautéed with some lovely kind of herbs, and offered it up for them to eat. And William said, oh, lovely, I'll try this, your darling, would you like to have a bit? Kate tried very hard to not pull a face. And we were all kind of sniggering in the background, but, but, but bless Kate, she did try it. She obviously thought it tasted disgusting, but she kept a straight face and said, isn't that lovely? It's fascinating to watch the royals at such close quarters and to get to see how they interact and, you know, those, those moments when the mask slips, that's all fascinating. Um, but it's also very interesting to see how the heads of state, the presidents, the prime ministers are who the royals are meeting. How you doing, buddy? You doing okay? In 2007, the Queen made her fourth state visit to Washington and even the president got a little flustered. You helped our nation celebrate its bicentennial in 17... In 1976. She gave me a look that only a mother could give a child. Tours are very carefully stage managed. They're very controlled by the palace. Um, it's why those unscripted moments, the spontaneous moments, always seem to make the biggest stories because they're not what we expected. Meeting a royal in the flesh can be overwhelming, but the royals have proven deft at the human moments that help break the ice. Charles and Diana visited Hungary in 1990. When we went there, the, uh, the president was not even the president, he was the president-elect, uh, Arpad Gontz. 
and he was quite nervous, and, and Mrs. Gotts was quite nervous at uh, sort of having coming out of, come out of the shadows of communism. All of a sudden, they were in the free world, and you've got this, this famous couple arriving. There's a wonderful moment when the Prince of Wales was inspecting the Guard of Honour with President Gauntz and Diana standing next to Mrs Gauntz. Clearly, Mrs Gauntz is quite nervous and Diana holds her hand uh, j just to calm her nerves. You are returning to your rightful place at the heart of a Europe which has been denied your presence for far too long. We join you in a determination to ensure that conflict and division never return to our continent. The days when kings and queens uh, possessed hard power are over, but they still have a huge amount of soft power and influence. And, you know, I don't think people in the UK really realise how big the royal family is around the world. They are still big news wherever you go, even in countries that have got rid of their royal families. I always remember Prince Harry when he was in Jamaica meeting the um, Prime Minister, Portia Simpson Miller, um, a Republican, by the way, who just seemed to melt in Harry's presence. You know, she was like starstruck, there was a big hug, there was a kiss for Harry. It was like they were best friends. Well, my goodness, the, the British government must have just been patting itself on its back for deciding to send Harry to Jamaica. Having Harry in Jamaica at this time is a reason for the youths. The tomorrow people, that's going to be the leaders, is excellent. So we're proud to have him and his, his energy is so great. If I had a pen, I'd ask him to sign my check. <laughs> <laughs> From rubbing shoulders with musical royalty to the more formal environments of state visits, some of Britain's most important international relationships are built on royal tours. It puts monarchs from different countries together and in a very sort of intimate and private way. The prince's first engagement was to call on the ruler of Bahrain. Their conversation turned to a subject very dear to Prince Charles's heart, his grandmother, the Queen Mother. With her operation on her hip, she's, a, like she's completely hip. revolutionary. Yes. Completely. And, uh, and now she's back to dancing again. Is she? Yes. Scottish dancing. Yeah. And uh, couldn't stop. Yeah. She's a phenomenon. Yeah. It's quite different, I think, sending a member of the royal family to, say, somewhere like the Middle East, where which have their own royal families as well. They can talk on a level that perhaps even our prime minister or our foreign secretary can't reach, because that kind of level of respect is, you know, an equal talking to an equal, whereas, frankly, a prime minister is, is, is viewed as somewhat, you know, below. So I do think that having a royal family is, is, is of benefit to Britain. Those countries get on better with other monarchs or members of the royal family than they would do with other envoys who might go on their behalf. So they've been very important in smoothing uh, the diplomacy uh, between the UK and, and those areas. For all their diplomatic efforts, the royals know it's the press that can make or break a tour, and that relationship requires constant attention. It's no secret that the relationship between the media and the royal family is, is fractious at times, tenuous. It's, it's not always a bed of roses, I think it's fair to say. Um, on royal tours, you get, I think, more cooperation and collaboration probably than at any other time. And I think that's quite simply because they want the tour to be a success. They need that oxygen of publicity. They need the media to be behind it. Despite their rocky history, relations with the media aren't always antagonistic, and it's the press that have set up some of the royals' most memorable photo ops. Charles had one of his famous Kodak moments in Australia in 1979. I remember it. I wasn't on that tour. It was in, in Australia in about 1980. It was before he was uh, engaged to, to Lady Diana Spencer, but there was a huge amount of interest in, he was known as Action Man Charles in those days. He was always throwing himself out of aeroplanes, parachuting or, or diving. And um, he was an enthusiast for anything. And one of the things he did like doing when he was in Australia was swimming. I'm not sure just how coincidental it was that the young lady concerned who threw herself around him and got that, that great picture of him, a surprise Prince Charles as he emerged from the waves, had actually been put up to it by the travelling photographers. You can't stage 
the Prince of Wales coming out of the water on a beach, crowded beach, and a girl coming out of the water on a crowded beach, running up to him, flinging her arms around him and giving him a peck on the cheek. Can't stage that. It, that was a spontaneous movement. Arthur was one of the travelling photographers on that royal tour and has a slightly different version. We just hired a model and, uh, and in a bikini, I think, and just asked her to um, run into the surf with him, and she did. And, of course, he, you know, he like, uh, yeah, that real handsome guy, you know, and he, and he looked good in a, in a bathing suit. And, uh, and he's running out and he's wet and he's laughing and they're running along the beach and that was it. You know, it wasn't a big deal. I didn't think it was. It was a great image for Charles. It was a very manly picture of him. And um, you know, I think it, it did his PR and his image um, a huge amount of good. On the one hand, you could argue that these royal tours are just a pretty picture, but I do think they have a huge positive impact. The face-to-face -face relationships built on royal tours have become a crucial part of modern royal life. But for the new generation of royals, they have also become an opportunity to pursue a more personal agenda. One of the things you get to see on, on royal tours is the royals at such close quarters. You get to know what they enjoy doing, and I think you get to have a better understanding of the people rather than the royals that they are. Royal tours date back more than 100 years to the reign of George V. Modern travel has enabled every royal since to tour abroad on behalf of Britain. The royal family's always gone on tour. Uh, the famous saying is, you know, I have to be seen to be believed. They've done it domestically and they've done it internationally now in the jet set age as well. And it's about promoting the brand of the royal family. It's the biggest royal family in the world. This is the moment everyone's waiting for. One of the things that you really see on these tours is that it is about cementing and securing those ties that date back to those early years of the Queen's reign when she gave up six months of her life and left her family to go and forge those connections. It's about making sure that those continue for the decades to come. One by one, the chiefs were presented to Her Majesty and to the Duke. Certainly a memorable and most impressive event during the royal tour of Ceylon, that land of ancient civilization and strong tradition. I do think the Queen and the way she has done royal tours has set the blueprint. But I think with the younger royals, we see their interests coming in a bit more. Harry and William's joint tour in 2010 gave a first indication of how the brothers would seek to rebrand the image of the royals abroad. I travelled with William and Harry on their first joint overseas tour to Africa in 2010. It had been Harry's idea. He wanted to take his brother to go and show him all the work that he was doing in Lesotho. And um, it was an amazing opportunity to see the brothers interact. An eight-foot rock python was ceremonially draped across the shoulders of the second and third in line to the throne. Not venomous, but still worth using to scare your older brother. It was fascinating to see the dynamic between the two of them and the camaraderie between the two of them. At points, rivalry too, you know, there's always the, the um, competitive element, I think, between William and Harry. But, um, you know, they, they were such a tight unit. They gave interviews, they spoke to the press, and um, they put the charities that they were wanting to highlight on the map. But really, it was about the boys. It was about the work that Harry was doing, and it was about him showing William his, his charity and everything that he had achieved. That tour had a profound effect on both brothers. Since then, they have made more than 90 official trips abroad, reshaping the tours to focus less on royal pageantry and more on their charity work. What William and Harry have developed is, yes, the public tour, the tour we all see about, and then the private trips they make behind the scenes. And they do quite a few of those that, you know, we don't get to cover. Harry has spent weeks and weeks in Africa directly working on conservation uh, projects against the illegal wildlife trade. So that, f that then feeds into what they want to do publicly. That is what's developing with both uh, William and Harry. They want to do less in terms of you know, spreading themselves thinly. They want to target what they're doing and do it, in their view, properly. Like his mother, Princess Diana, Harry's high-profile tours have focused on humanitarian issues. 
Harry, probably more like his mother in his approach to things, but he's developed his own personality. Um, he is his own man. He likes to meet the kind of dispossessed, the people who need help, and he wants to understand the social needs of the country that he's visiting, because he genuinely thinks that he can help and he can make a difference. But the only way to do that is to visit the townships in South Africa, go to the favelas in South America, visit the slums in Asia. And he realises, he, William, all the members of the royal family, but in particular, I'd say William and, William and Harry, realise they have very privileged positions, but also realise that most of the world is very, very different and the people live very, very differently from them. Prince Harry's recent tour has also given us a glimpse of what royal tours might look like in the future. Harry and Meghan's tour to Southern Africa, I think, is, is really key because they're getting rid of a lot of uh, what some people might think of the boring sides to a royal tour, and they're pursuing precisely what they want to promote. For example, the uh, youth charities, the mental health side of things. I think most of the, the stigmas around mental illness, right? We need to separate the two, the mental health, which is every single one of us, and then men mental illness, which could be every single one of us. But I think they need to be, they need to be separated because the mental health element touches on so much of what we're exposed to, these experiences that these kids and every single one of us has been through. Everyone has experienced trauma or will likely experience trauma some, at some point during their lives. We need to try and... They have done things in their own way. Uh, the Duchess have stayed, has stayed in Cape Town, doing the sort of things that interest her, but with very much an NGO base to it. It was clear this was a different royal tour. There was no red carpet welcome, there was no official reception, there was no visit to the war memorial. They went straight to a township on the outskirts of Cape Town. That speech that Meghan made really made a massive impact. I'm here with my husband as a member of the royal family. I want you to know that for me, I am here with you as a mother, as a wife, as a woman, as a woman of color and as your sister. If you needed to show how the royal family has changed, that's it. And Harry's vision of a modern royal tour seems to have struck a chord. This was a really important tour because it came at a time when the Sussexes, who'd enjoyed so much popularity around their wedding, were suddenly in firefighting mode there were so many negative headlines. So it was a really important moment for them to turn things around and show what they do best, that Sussex star appeal. Both brothers have remodeled the royal tour, though for the king and waiting, a more symbolic approach is still needed. For William and Kate, it is a little bit more formal. There are definitely some of Diana's charities that William is promoting when he goes on the royal tours. But he is going to have to do more of the dull stuff on a royal tour, the diplomacy, the trade missions. As a future King of England and leader of the Commonwealth, William has expanded the royal tour to showcase Britain's relationship with its diplomatic allies. I think the recent tour of Kate William to Pakistan shows how important that kind of soft diplomacy is. It sends out a strong signal to the rest of the world that this is a country on the mend. Yes, it's had huge problems in the past, but you know, diplomatically, business terms, sport terms, Pakistan is a, a great country, and, and the royals, you know, as part of the Commonwealth, wanted to show that. The view from this hill would have been quite different when my grandmother, the Queen, first visited over half a century ago. And with successive visits by my mother and my father, this view has continued to change, with the city constantly growing and with it my family's affection for Pakistan. A successful tour like William and Kate's in Pakistan can make it all look easy, but the royals work hard to maintain their accessible and personable image overseas. Royal tours are incredibly time-consuming. They are exhausting. I think the royals have a knack of making them look almost like holidays because they're always smiling. Royal tours do demand a huge amount of acting. If you're not feeling great, if you're feeling a bit of colour, if you just want to watch a bit of TV, if you want to go for a swim in the hotel pool, no, no, you've got to be up an atom at 6am in the morning, if not earlier, and be like, yeah, you know, jazz hands. 
because that interaction is going to be the most important interaction for that person for that month, if not for the year. If not, they might still be talking about it for the rest of their lives. The royal family uh, have effect on people. They never forget it. They never forget the time they met Prince William. And the family will never forget it. If there's a picture of it, it will be in the family archives forever. And they're aware of that, they're aware of that, and I'm aware of that. So if I see some picture like that, I so get their email address and I'll send them the picture because I know how important it is to them. And it's not just the public who are besotted. Some of the world's most powerful people seem equally impressed by the royal family. When they go to business receptions, it is noticeable how all of these titans of industry who never wait for anything will just line up waiting to meet the Queen's grandchild to, to meet Harry or to meet William or Meghan and, and Kate as well. So to get business people into a room with the Queen or Prince Charles or Diana or you know William and Kate, whoever, is a big deal. There is this fascination with our royal family. It doesn't matter who it is, the crowds do turn out because here we are in the 21st century and I suppose a monarchy is a bit of anachronism but our monarchy is strong, uh, it will remain strong, and given it, its strength today and the way it evolves and has evolved over the years, it's likely to be here well into the 22nd century. <laughs>